what, what a weekend. And, and, and whoo, spring. <laughs> spring is finally here. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of spring. Don't jinx it. <laughs> Don't jinx it. Although, uh, you see, <clears throat> the, what, the thing that happened on Wednesday here, uh, I don't know where everybody was that day, but it was just the weirdest maelstrom of strange weather with uh, pouring rain and thunderstorms and freezing rain. And then we had a bunch, we had a lot of hail here that stayed on the ground for hours. And our, our poor little dog was terrified and, you know, terrorized by this thunder and lightning most of the day. Uh, but to me, and it, it, it swept about, I don't know, an awful big chunk of the, of the snow away. So it was like that big bam was like the, to me, the end of winter and the start of spring, right? Yeah. So, so here's the thing. <clears throat> We appreciate spring a whole lot more, and this, this kind of weather, because we've gone through winter. We've gone through that long, hard winter. Well, maybe it wasn't that long and hard for you, but I've been whining about it for quite a while now, and I shall continue to do so. <laughs> it, and, you know, it, it's another, another lesson in you know, why, how you appreciate things. So I, I had a, a weird winter in which I got sick like two or three times of bad colds, and then I got COVID, which I don't recommend. And... Uh, uh, I got hurt in hockey. I think I cracked some ribs, and that took me down for a while. Plus, I found out I got some, not because I'm getting older, but I might have some arthritis in my vertebrae. It caused, caused me some back pain. I'm not getting, I'm not getting older. But, but the, I, I feel pretty good right now, like, comparatively speaking. So you really appreciate your health when you've been sick, when you've been in pain. When, it, when it's over, you know, it's, a, uh, it's something you appreciate. Uh, we... we we're beginning to appreciate normality. <laughs> we used to take it for granted before COVID came along. And now as we slowly kind of come back to it, we, we're like, yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. We don't, not wearing masks, for instance. We're not wearing masks in church today, <coughs> most of us. And uh, so it, it, it's a choice now. Uh, recommended, but not insisted upon. And, you know, all the other uh, things we've been through for the last three years. Uh, it, was a, it was three years of weirdness, really. So you can't really get Easter. You can't really get it. Doesn't, it isn't meaningful. The significance doesn't really hit you without some realization of the lead up of the sorrows of Jesus. So that's why, you know, this is the weekend where we have them back to back. We have Good Friday. And we just, it's just, you know, it's, it's the death of Christ, the sufferings, the sacrifice, you know, juxtaposed with Sunday, Easter Sunday and his resurrection. Um. <coughs> A few years ago, I went to uh, the Maundy Thursday. So there's the, the Thursday before Good Friday is called Maundy Thursday. For those of you, you probably knew that, but just in case you didn't. We don't really do a big thing here, but the, the Anglicans do. And uh, a few years ago, the, I went to their Maundy Thursday service at St. George's, the Anglican church here in town. And uh, I'd never been before. I have never been since. It was very moving and surprising, simplicity. So basically, they did this thing where they, they, they called the stripping of the altar. And the altar is actually quite elaborate, got, you know, quite a few decorative, uh, you know, uh, meaningful items on it. And the, in dead silence and semi-darkness, bit by bit, they take away all those pieces off the altar till it's just bare. And it's very dramatic. And it just struck me as kind of parallel to, to the story of Jesus, in his, especially in his latter days, his latter last week of his life and the sufferings that he went through. Um, and that's a huge chunk of the Gospels. You know, so as you know, there are four Gospels in our New Testament. Uh, the Gospel of John is about half dedicated to like the last week of Jesus' life and then the resurrection. Uh, the other three are about, about a third of them. So, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's the lead up, you know, his ministry and such, but a big chunk uh, all, in all the Gospels is given over to the last few days. The, the details just suddenly come, come out like crazy. Uh, obviously, you know, the Holy Spirit is telling us th through the gospel writers that this is of great significance. This is the thing. Paul, for instance, when he, when he writes, uh, he, you know, he, there is no pre Paul writes his letters. He, there's no preamble about the teachings of Jesus. He just says, you know, I came, when I came among you, I was determined to know nothing, nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he talks about the cross, the cross, the cross. So to me, the, the parallel with the, the stripping of the altar was this is what happened to Jesus. He was stripped of everything. Bit by bit, really. I mean, he, he, uh, he, he starts out at this feast, the feast of the Passover, which the Jews celebrated and continue to celebrate and will celebrate every year, remembering their salvation, their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. 
So every year they would have this supper. So Jesus was having it with his disciples. It's time for rejoicing, time for celebration. Uh, and, but already stuff was happening. Judas slips out and he goes, to, goes away to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, when, they, when they retreat after the supper, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and, and sure enough, uh, Judas is, is leading a, a bunch of soldiers there to, to arrest Jesus. And once that happens, everybody flees. All the disciples, Simon Peter, who said, Lord, even though I have to die, I will not leave you. And Jesus says, you know, by the time the, the rooster crows, you will have uh, uh, denied me three times. No, and he did. So, you know, he's abandoned by all his friends. So he's stripped of his relationships. They all go to the four winds. Then uh, he, he goes through this, the mockery of a trial, which is a joke. I mean, he's brought up before the, the high priests and the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, which is the council of the Jews. And they, they, they march out uh, uh, false witnesses to, to, to try to make up stuff against him, and nothing sticks. Finally, they just decide to take him to Pilate, who's the Roman governor. And uh, Pilate doesn't really want to have anything to do with this. But they just pressure him and pressure him and, and yell, crucify him, crucify him, until he caves. And he says, I, you know, I was in our, our cantata on Friday. You know, I, I, he, said, I, he washes his hands of the whole affair. And he says, you know, his blood be on your head. So it was, a, you know, what they call a kangaroo court. And his, he was stripped of justice. He's, then, then he's really stripped. He's, they strip him of his clothes and all of his protection and all of his comforts. All that's taken away. And then he's stripped of respect and he's stripped of dignity because that's what the cross does. It was designed to shame you and humiliate you utterly, to put you up as a, you know, a, a, a mockery point you know, for people to, to, to mock and spit at and curse. And that's exactly what happens to Jesus. You can, it's, it's in the Gospels. And finally, he's stripped of his life. The uh, Stations of the Cross, which are still available for a day or two here, uh, we have a couple of them here, and they start in Inglesby, go from Inglesby to Lachlan to here, uh, all through the village, the various churches, then you can go to, West, to Eagle Lake and West Guilford. And basically, that's the story they tell, the story of Jesus' sorrows, the passion of the Lord, uh, the stripping of Jesus, of all, you know, all the human comforts and normal human things. Now, it, in, in, in short order, what happened to Jesus is, reflects the human story. Uh, you know, the, the, kind of the awfulness of what's happened to us. Jesus stands in our place, and he takes the abuse that humans uh, perpetrate on one another. His story is the story of the human race. You just have to read the Bible, watch the news, and I can assure you you'll pick it up. Uh, they, they, they tell us, tell it like it is. So it's the story of broken relationships, just like here, what happened to Jesus. Failed leadership, like what happened to Jesus. Arrogance, injustice, like what happened to Jesus. And violence, like what happened to Jesus. There's a song, though, a song that the choir sings. And I guess they haven't sung it yet this year. We've only had about, what, four goes? <laughs> four or five goes. But uh, the, uh, I stand amazed. I stand amazed. Stand amazed at Jesus. There's an old hymn like that too. I know it better. So it's an old gospel hymn. I stand amazed at the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene. I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. I don't know if you, if you know that one. But we stand amazed because this wasn't just some clever, heroic guy. This was our God, our maker, come in the flesh. Our gentle God, our kind God, our compassionate God loving, and very, very patient God. Jesus reveals him. And, you know, we abandoned him, condemned him, tortured him, and even killed him. And what does he say? At the cross, astonishingly, amazingly, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. We should stand amazed. So th that's the lead-up. That's the background to what we're celebrating today. Uh, that's the long, hard winter, <laughs> which you have to hear about to get the significance of this day. You know, he is risen indeed. And in today's reading, that's what we find out, that he doesn't stay dead. Uh, and these stories, I believe, they come from the first century. They're very early. Uh, are, are, are eyewitness accounts to the resurrected Christ. Um, 
you know, there, there's no credible scholar that will, you know, can, will argue against that they were, they were widely circulated, like within the first generation. Uh, people knew about it. People, people were available who could go and refute it if they, you know, they had any, any way or means to do that. And nobody has ever done that. So, you know, they stand. And uh, they, they hit us uh, as credible. So the human parts especially are quite recognizable to us. Mary Magdalene, she goes to the, she goes to the tomb, and Jesus isn't there, so she, she comes running to, the, uh, to Simon Peter and the other disciple. He says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. She's upset, she's so sorrowful, she's panicky. And then it says, interesting, this, this is a curiosity in the gospel. He says, so, so Peter and the other disciple, so the other disciple is commonly understood to be John the, John the, the apostle who wrote the, this, this, uh, who wrote this gospel, who never calls himself by name. Oh, he says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> Uh, but he says, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Well, who really cares? <laughs> but, but that's a human, <laughs> that's a very human thing to do, you know. Especially, I don't know, little girls and little boys. Uh, it's always, you know, I got there first. It, it reminded me this morning of a little Easter egg hunt that happened at our place with four, four grandkids. And uh, it was a little bit competitive, shall we say. You know, there were some that were determined to, to, to get more than the others and to see more than the others and, you know, a little bit braggish about it. So, I mean, that's a human touch there <laughs> uh, that, that rings true. And, and when uh, uh, Jesus comes later, he, she's crying. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And uh, that's a very normal way to deal with death, with grief. Now, there are other things that are, are, are not so familiar to us. The, the divine parts, like that there's an empty tomb, <laughs> And that there's angels in that tomb. And that, you know, these cloths are rolled up and put by the side. I mean, there's, a, there's significance to that, which we, we don't need to get into today. Uh, and that then Jesus, she actually sees Jesus. Mary, Mary as Leslie pointed out, the first person to see him, the first witness, was a woman. Which is another cause for the, the, the credibility of the gospel accounts. Because in, in those days, women were not considered to be credible witnesses. And yet, they couldn't get around it. Mary was the first witness, so there she is in all the texts. It's quite amazing. Um, <laughs> so here's what happened. Nobody was there to see it. Very quietly, first day of the week, Sunday morning, Jesus stepped out of the tomb. He'd been dead for a couple days. His sorrows were ended. His triumph had begun. <clears throat> and the resurrection of Jesus spells the beginning of the end of sorrow and of evil, the end of injustice, the end of guilt and shame, and of course, the end of death itself. And herein lies our hope and our joy. May we today renew our trust in this, our risen Savior. And he wasn't just risen alive and well in the first century. He re remains risen and alive and well today. That's why I, I called this sermon actually Risen Today, because we sang the song, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. My, my, my sense was it doesn't just mean, oh, he, you know, we're remembering that day. We're, we're also celebrating that he is in the risen state today. He is risen and resurrected now. May we know he lives. And may we renew our commitment by his grace to be his faithful followers and to bring his good news to our hurting world. Shall we pray?